Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of White and Williams Subro Sessions podcast. My name is Melissa Kenny. I'm here today with Catherine Dempsey. We are both associates here at White and Williams Subrogation and Recovery Department. We are very excited for today's episode. We have a very special guest. Her name is Miss Rachel Klein. She is a senior fire investigator from EFI Global. Both Catherine and I have worked with Rachel on several fire losses. Rachel brings a wealth of knowledge, training, and experience to fire origin and cause investigation. We're really excited about today's episode. It's going to be both personal and informative. Rachel's going to tell us about her upbringing and how that played a role in her decision to become a fire investigator. Then we're going to talk about fire scene investigations and more specifically, getting control of the scene and ensuring evidence is preserved timely. So let's get into it. Hi, Rachel. This is Catherine. Thank you for being here today. Hello. Hello. Thanks for inviting me. So, Rachel, why don't you tell us a little bit what made you become a senior fire investigator? Um, So it actually started at an early age. Um, Basically, I grew up in the fire service. Um, I was brought in, you know, through family. My, My grandfather was in the fire service. My dad was in the fire service. He was actually fire chief. Um, I honestly remember going in the back of his truck to certain fire scenes um, because you could do that in a very rural area. Um, So I basically grew up in it. And, you know, my mother was in it, aunts, uncles. So pretty much anytime we did fundraisers, it was pretty much a whole family event where everybody was there. So for me, growing up that way was the norm. I didn't really know anything different. Um, So that was basically how my love for it really started. And I just never left. (laughs) Um, Once you catch that fire bug, per se, um, that's basically all you want to do. And I loved helping the community. um, And I love the community that I was in. Um, Then at that point is what I wanted to do is I absolutely loved science. Um, So I wanted to expand, you know, the two and, and basically put them together. So so what I ended up doing was I went to college um, for an undergrad degree through Binghamton University. Um, it was actually anthropology with a minor in biology. And I do get a lot of people, you know, asking me questions about how the two relate. And, you know, it's actually very similar when we are doing the archaeological digs of how we dig out a fire scene in terms of gridding, layering. It's it's very, very, very similar. Um, and it's what I ended up doing from there was went to University of New Haven. Um, that's in Connecticut. Changed my master's degree um, in fire science and then did a certificate in public safety management. Um, throughout this whole entire time, I was still volunteering. So no matter what state I was in, that was something that I always felt like I had to do, um, give to my community. And I was also taking classes and learning. Um, so even though I was taking you know, classes for my master's degree, um, I was also taking classes through the state and doing their fire marshal course. So I was doing their course was separated out into fire investigations, and then codes. Um, So I was taking that while going to school. Um, As soon as I finished school, um, that's when I started taking up the certifications, um, like getting your CFBI through NAFI, um, and then basically kind of progressing to the point where I was like, okay, I'm ready for a job. Um, So that's when I applied to Unified Investigations, um, is what the name of it was at the time. Um, Ended up going to Baltimore where they said, hey, we needed an evidence tech. So I started out actually as being a part-time fire investigator, part-time evidence tech, which for me was great in terms of getting exposure in the field um, with other fire investigators. So I would basically go to them, um, to their scenes, and do their evidence collection. So they definitely taught me well in terms of, hey, this is what you need to do while you're at a scene. Um, But then I was responsible for doing all the evidence in terms of documenting, collecting, make sure the chain of custody was correct. Um, So I definitely think that helped me in terms of where I'm at now, um, because I'm very, very detailed and thorough on that, because that's where I started um, in the company. Um, Since then, I've progressed in terms of doing, you know, fair scenes, large losses, um, obtained more certifications. Um, So I have been taking um, classes in terms of doing marine uh, classes, vehicles. Um, I did obtain, you know, my III CFI. Um, so I've definitely tried to expand, you know, my, my horizons and start specializing in things. So I actually did two in Vermont, a, a chimney and fireplace class and everything I'm going to spend six days, you know, learning about chimneys and fireplaces. No, but why I love this job. 
um, because you're always learning. And for me, um, that's what kind of made it easy to, to stay with the company, stay with this job and continue as a senior fire investigator, um, basically gaining these certifications um, in order to do that. And I absolutely love what I do. And I feel like that has, like I said, made me progress to be a senior fire investigator. Well, that's awesome. And, you know, thank you for sharing and for all the volunteer work you've done. That's um, certainly not an easy task. And it's clear that you have a passion for what you do. And I think that is part of what makes you so enjoyable to work with. So thank you for that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, I still love hopping on the engine every now and then. And, you know, I, that's what I, mean. I love doing that with the community, the fundraisers. Like, it's it's great. It's great. Yeah. So, Rachel, in terms of evidence collection and pre- preserving a site of loss, can you walk us through a little bit about what you do at these loss sites? Of course. So, um, you know, every fire investigator, we kind of have a couple rule books, per se, that we follow. So all of our information um, that, per se, makes me a fire investigator and what I do is going to be an NFPA 1033. But, per se, the way that I do the investigations, that's through our guideline of NFPA 921. Um, So just kind of give you guys a brief idea of some of the things that I'm looking for um, at a lost site or doing at a lost site when I get there. Um, Obviously, the main thing I want to do is look for my fire effects and my fire patterns to get me back to my area of origin. It's very critical for us to get to our area of origin first um, before we can even begin to consider causation um, and look for possible causes. So it's very important for me to be able to, uh, per se, analyze those fire effects and those fire patterns to get me back to that area of origin. Um, so while I'm there, um, you know, I'm obviously going to be doing sketches. I'm going to be doing diagrams, measurements. Um, usually I do neighborhood canvases. Um, absolutely love the fact that everybody has cameras, ring doorbells. So that's very critical um, for some of the things that we do. Um, I know sometimes it looks ridiculous when we're running around door to door, putting business cards, saying, wait, call me. Um, But, you know, sometimes you never know when you're going to get that one person that's like, oh, yeah, I have that picture of, you know, where the fire first started. So that's a very important thing of of what we do, um, which includes, you know, interviews, you know, obviously with the insured, with the homeowner, but also with the neighbors. Um, Sometimes, you know, you have those those neighbors that, you know, will literally tell you everything and then some um, about what they saw, which is great. The more information for me, the better. Um, so sometimes it's important to take the time to have those conversations. Um, some of the other things that I'm looking for, um, is obviously if we have subrogation, um, potential, or if we also have a liability. So, you know, I I have to preserve the scene either way. Um, but I always like to try to give my client a heads up of, Hey, yeah, you potentially have some subrogation with this. This is why we need to preserve this. But also on the flip side of that, um, I also have to look for exposures, other people that have damages and say, hey, you guys also could potentially have, you know, liability um, from these other parties and try to identify those other parties. So that's kind of one of the other things I'm looking for is what other parties do we need to bring in, if any. Um, So that kind of brings in the evidence a little bit of when we get down to possibly a room of origin that I'm looking at. you know, what kind of evidence is in there that needs to be preserved? Um, in terms of the evidence, is the manufacturer identifiable? Um, did the insured purchase something from Amazon and can give me a receipt so that way we can put those folks on notice? Um, so identifying other parties, whether it be exposures, neighbors, whether it be somebody that you guys need to be placing on notice for a joint site inspection, um, is all very critical um, while going out there doing your initial site inspection. Um, the point of, you know, me going out there for that initial site inspection is definitely get the boots on the ground and get that information to you guys. Thanks, Rachel. And and so with all of that in mind, we we all know that time is of the essence with these fire scene investigations. So once you get out there, what steps are you taking before you leave the scene um, to make sure that it's secure, to make sure that any evidence um, that could possibly go, quote unquote, missing is secure and preserved? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, I mean, we've got a couple different things that we can do. It kind of depends on the circumstances and the situation and also where I'm at. So, I mean, in terms of areas that I cover, you know, some of it's Baltimore City. Um, Things do disappear. Um, Same, you know, sometimes with D.C., sometimes going into Philly, um, where we have a tendency if something's left outside, it's not going to be there anymore. 
Um, so one of the first and foremost things that I'm going to be doing at a scene is documenting it the best that I can while I'm out there. Um, that includes especially the, the sketches, the diagrams, photographs. Um, one of the other things that's kind of a, a newer, um, you know, technology is doing the Matterports and the drones. Um, so for me, I feel like those, those are super important, um, because one, I can send, you know, the links to you guys and you guys can basically walk through the fire scene and see it how I did. Um, and sometimes the drone footage is fantastic when you have a commercial loss site, um, and basically you can document the entirety of the building from the top. I get it. Some areas you have no fly zones and you're kind of out of luck with that. Um, but to be able to document the best you can. Um, prior to things being moved is absolutely critical because every now and then you get that homeowner that's just so easy to get started or you have you know the commercial property owner that somehow he has a bulldozer um, so you want to make sure that you document it the best that you can because you can always tell them hey you know try not to touch this but um, you know sometimes that just doesn't you know happen and the best way to you know go about that is is to preserve and document the best that we can. So some of the other things that we do um, include, you know, just caution tape. But I always say tape is only for honest people. <laughs> you can always lift it and go underneath of it. So there are plenty of times where, you know, we'll, we'll put what we call placards or signage up um, saying, hey, this is under investigation. Don't touch it. This is evidence. Um, and it, it's kind of funny. I do have a little bit of a reputation where people know when I'm there because, like, I will literally put tape everywhere. I put signs everywhere. Like, I put them on front doors in the house it doesn't matter like i want to make it obvious of what i'm trying to preserve um to anybody um and that way too sometimes those placards you know i put my name and number on there so sometimes you have an adjuster show up from say another property and they'll see the sign and they end up giving me a phone call saying hey you know we have an exposure or we have this so that kind of also helps get people on the same page um, by putting up those placards um, every now and then with the really large losses, um, or where if we knock out, you know, a couple townhomes type of deal because of the fire, um, or commercial structure, there are times when I do have to request about getting a fence. Um, uh, just, you know, we do have debris and stuff that goes outside or something along the lines of an explosion. Um, cause we want to try to preserve it as much as we can. And I, I get it. It's, it's very interesting to a lot of people. I mean, to me too, that's why I'm in the field, right? Um, but you know, sometimes putting that fence there is very critical, um, just to try to keep people out, um, to preserve the scene as best as we can for joint site inspections. Absolutely. Thanks for giving us all of that information. And with all of that in mind, too, can you give us some tips about what subrogation professionals, maybe subrogation attorneys, or even first-party claim adjusters can do to assist you early on with your investigation um, when it comes to making sure the site is secure and evidence-preserved? Yeah, so one of the most, I feel like, critical things is trying to get your experts or your boots on the ground out there as soon as possible. Um, sometimes, you know, if we get these losses and I'm like, oh, man, it happened three months ago. I go out there and I was like, it's down to the wall studs. Like, what am I going to do with that? So it's really important to get us out as soon as possible. So that way we, we are able to put in those measures to try to preserve the scene um, for, you know, future inspections. Um and, you know, sometimes it, it's important to tell the insured to like who we are and what we're doing. So sometimes I'll show up or, you know, I call the insured and I, I try to explain, hey, this is what I do. Um, you know, I'd like to come out and meet with you. And then they're like, well, I already had the adjuster come out and I have to explain, well, you know, I'm not actually the adjuster. I do something different, I, you know, a different part of the team type of deal. Um, but sometimes having the insured hear that from, you know, their adjuster or from their insurance carrier puts them a little bit more at ease of like, hey, why is this person contacting me? Because you have to understand too, like when these folks go through these losses, a lot of people are contacting them. And sometimes it's difficult and, you know, confusing for them of, hey, who am I actually supposed to be talking with? Who am I supposed to be letting in my property? Because um, sometimes, like I said, you do get exposures and other fire investigators are contacting them or you know, public adjusters are contacting them and it's overwhelming for them. So sometimes it's nice, um, you know, for the adjuster just explain, hey, this is your person to talk to. Like, this is your fire investigator to communicate with. It's okay to talk with them. Um, and once we usually kind of establish that, it goes much smoother um, in terms of information flow. Um, so just, you know, getting us out there as soon as possible and letting your insured know or whoever we're meeting with that, hey, you know, we're, you know, the fire investigator for you guys um, and to basically explain what we're doing. So that way there's no confusion on their end. 
Yeah, absolutely. Time is of the essence and communication is key with the subrogation fire investigation. That is for sure. Thanks so much, Rachel. I'm going to turn it over to Catherine, who's going to end our interview with you with a few more questions. Hi, Rachel. So I would like to know, what is your favorite part of being a senior fire investigator? I'd say I don't have one. I have two. <laughs> so, well, you know, maybe maybe like three. So the, the thing is, is I absolutely love the people I get to work with and the people I get to meet. I get a lot of times I'm meeting these people on like their, their worst possible day. You know, they they don't want to see me. You know what I mean? Like I'm not a person they want to see. So you know, when I get to go out there and, and talk with them and they tell me their stories, you know, I really enjoy, you know, hearing that and just being with the people. Um, and the other thing is, too, is in terms of, for me, this career, it's I'm always learning. I'm always doing something new. So that's really enjoyable um, where it's not the same thing every day, for sure. Like it's it's I never know what I'm going to get. You know, one day I could be, you know, doing a car. I could be doing a boat. I could be doing commercial property. Uh, just a kitchen fire so it, it's kind of nice to have that variety of hey it's a very spontaneous type of job and I never know what I'm going to be doing who I'm going to run into um, and that's that's what keeps things interesting and, and the fact that I do get to meet all these people I'm always learning from them same with like the engineers when I do joint site inspections and lab exams like I'm constantly learning from from other people and and their knowledge so it's nice to be able to have that kind of community where we can basically spread all that knowledge around and it's it's wonderful to be honest I love it that's awesome and it's again so clear your passion for what you do and I think that you know Melissa and I have both worked with you and know that from firsthand experience you go the extra mile and you know help make our job easier make everyone who's involved their job easier and so we would just like to thank you for that and uh, thank you for sharing all of your wealth of knowledge and um we, you know, certainly look forward to working with you again in the future and highly recommend Rachel Klein of EFI Global to anyone who's looking for a senior fire investigator who is passionate about what they do and goes the extra mile. So thank you, Rachel. And uh, thank you for taking the time to speak with us this morning and, and share your wealth of knowledge. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Subro Sessions. Be sure to listen to the next episode of Subro Sessions. You can find past episodes of the podcast and relevant case updates on the Subrogation Strategist blog, all available at whiteandwilliams.com.